Perfect. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, great pleasure to be back here at KTP. Uh, this is my first time to see actual rain out here, so I will rush through my talk because I want to take pictures for my family. Uh, they were here in July and there was all sunshine. Um, yeah, and thanks, of course, to the organizers for inviting me, uh, uh, putting together a really interesting conference looking at a diverse set of different experimental setups that I'm really enjoying. Uh, and, of course, thanks to KTP for the awesome hospitality that we are enjoying again. Okay, um, so the talk is now, to give you an orientation, reconnecting to something um, that we heard about partially in previous talks, the question of thermalization and closed uh, quantum antibody systems. So uh, Michael and uh, Markus touched a little bit about on that. And we'll continue tomorrow morning and talks about ETH uh, and quantum scars and um, other instances of weekly ergodicity breaking systems. Uh, so basically, we're back to the question of closed quantum systems uh, unitary uh, global time evolution, as also Stefan talked about in his talk, and basically the question if you look at local observables uh, and ask whether they eventually um, at long times uh, equilibrate, as Michael talked about, and then possibly even thermalize. So there's already a lot of work, uh, with contributions from Marcos and others, uh, that set up a framework to answer at least with a set of sufficient conditions to tell us that most generic quantum antibody systems actually do that if they are interacting. Um, but as physicists, of course, we like to have the exceptions, yeah? so we like to uh, try to play tricks on Boltzmann, if, uh, if I may say it like this, uh, and find systems that uh, at least the time domain or at least on finite systems uh, don't thermalize as quickly as generic systems. Okay. Um, and in this landscape um, of, so to speak, uh, ergodic systems that, um, for the purpose of this talk, I will all uh, summarize onto systems that uh, obey ETH. Um, so I'm only talking about generic quantum antibody systems. I'm excluding everything that is integrable. Uh, there's this biggest uh, class of Hamiltonians that uh, actually do thermalize. Uh, then candidates for systems that don't thermalize, most well-known MBL, but we all know that there's ongoing discussion about its actual stability. And new candidates that come from this um, direction of so-called constraint dynamics. And that's uh, uh, sort of the theme in this talk now. So what is constraint dynamics? Um, it comes about in, the, in a lot of fashions. The, 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 yeah, the, the sort of mechanisms that I'll talk about in this talk is mostly kinetically constrained systems. So basically, imagine that you have single particle processes uh, that can flip a spin or move a particle around on a lattice. Um, and then you put constraints that make that flip or motion dependent on the environment, the number of particles sitting on the other sides. Yeah? So this is probably the, uh, the, the um, uh, easiest way to see that. Um, other mechanisms that introduce uh, constraints are, for instance, dipole conservation. Uh, these systems lead to Hilbert space fragmentation. Uh, and lattice gauge theories is another platform to, that, that co can contribute to that. So the manifestations, and we hear more about, we hear more about that tomorrow, is quantum scars, Hilbert space fragmentation. Um, and the question that I'd like to frame this into that many people have already also worked on is, uh, if we yeah, squeeze constraint dynamics, uh, systems with constraint dynamics in between ergodic and non-ergodic, which way will they actually go? Huh? So some of them we know are weakly ergodicity breaking, so quantum scars typically are zero, uh, measure zero in the number of eigenstates of the full Hilbert space. They will typically, uh, in, in almost all cases, uh, uh, thermalize, uh, but the interesting question is also, can we push systems into this direction? And one very natural knob is, of course, to throw in disorder. Yeah, so most of these systems that have constraint dynamics will be translation invariant to begin with. But then once we kick in disorder, um, and that will be the theme of this talk, uh, can we push actually systems from, uh, from this area in between possibly towards localization? OK. Um, so where do constraint systems exist in experiments? And this is a little bit how it connects to the theme of long range interactions. I would say most of the experiments that uh, have uh, demonstrated the existence of constraints in quantum many-body systems actually come from systems that have underlying long-range directions, such as Wittberg, uh, Gases, and uh, Misha mentioned this. Uh, similar to your talk, uh, the idea is we have like physics that comes from long-range directions that eventually boil down to short-range constraints of the systems, uh, for, for instance, Wittberg blockade. Yeah? And beautifully, this experience from six years ago that showed long uh, uh, lift oscillations that uh, started the whole discussion and interest in, um, in quantum scars. Yeah. Um, more recently, there's also experiments from neutral atoms and optical lattices with uh, short range interactions. Here, an example from Munich, um, where they used uh, tilted uh, lattices that, in the uh, limit of strong tilts, uh, 
uh, also lead to approximate dipole conservation and then lead to a shattering of the Hilbert space and also affect the, uh, the relaxation dynamics. Um, all right, so there's already some experiments out there, but the overarching scheme is where do we place uh, systems uh, with constraints in this uh, overall landscape. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in this talk is after the short introduction on constraint dynamics, I will actually focus on uh, models that have kinetic constraints. Um, so I showed you examples of kinetic constraints at the beginning. The sort of models that we're interested in are actually motivated from classical physics. So there's an additional interest here uh, in glass physics. Um, and uh, the, the model that I mostly talk about was introduced in that context. I'll talk about this later. It's essentially been cooked up to have a mechanism to get glass physics as I increase the density. Yeah? So this is an additional uh, direction. And there's a whole family of models that essentially come from that direction that we're now uh, taking over into the quantum realm and studying their thermalization properties. Okay, um, and we'll ask how, how this yeah, tendency to glass physics uh, possibly uh, crosses over into uh, localization. So time, uh, time depending, I will talk a little bit about um, a technical measure that we're using uh, in analyzing this sort of system, uh, but we'll see how it um, actually goes. Um, so the question of uh, kinetic constraints and disorder has already been addressed by some um, uh, a number of other groups. So here are some examples. Um, and the sampling, this is uh, just three examples, uh, will actually show that um, there's no um, yeah, unifying theme yet. Yeah? So once I add disorder, the system can either become um, localized or actually turn out to be uh, thermalizing. Here's an example from Anusha Chandran's group from uh, a, number, a couple of years ago. Um, and here the, the, the upshot of that story is that uh, there is, so to speak, constraints, yeah, and this is a PXP model, and then uh, uh, these two co uh, coupling constants are disordered, and when these are transfers to each other, then the constraints or the disorder actually frustrates, uh, frustrate each other. Yeah? So in that case, uh, once you uh, crank up G in this phase diagram, you can actually go to a uh, uh, um, thermalizing phase, uh, different from, uh, from intuition. Uh, whereas in the other direction, um, uh, typically localization takes over. So here's a similar model um, from the Krakow group. Uh, they put out a more um, yeah, a, a, a relatively, uh, um, yeah, relatively demanding numerical study and looked at um, uh, the scaling of the critical disorder strength in such models here. So we're putting quench disorder here. Uh, and what they find is actually bad news for localization physics again, similar to the standard model of MBL, spinless fermions with interactions. Uh, this actually appears to uh, scale linearly and there's no indication that there is actually uh, uh, delocalization, localization, like localization transition in the thermodynamic limit. No? So the third example is a bit slightly different. So here we don't have uh, quench disorder but disorder on the diagonal of a many-body Hamiltonian, that's the family of East, um, so, sorry, of random energy models here combined with East constraints. Um, and in this story, um, there is a claim that this is localization, but no Fox space localization in the sense of uh, um, typical MBL with quasi particles or, or lions. Okay, so what we take away from that is that uh, it apparently depends on the yeah, actual implementation of kinetic constraints, whether you get localization or not. Uh, and in this uh, story here where they numerically showed um, that for light systems, probably there's no um, um, stable localized phase. Uh, the, the argument that they um, developed is that essentially the question of whether the kinetic constraints and disorder cooperate or, um, or compete uh, depends a bit on in which basis you formulate the problem. Uh, and you can typically find basis sets where the disorder acts like an interaction and hence delocalizes or, or counters the constraints and vice versa. Yeah, so that's a bit the, uh, the, the, the picture that the Krakow uh, group put forward. Okay, so in this uh, story, we wanted to have a study one more example. And again, our motivation uh, came more from looking at systems that on the classical level have uh, uh, spin glass physics. Um, so that's one motivation for uh, looking at this particular model. And uh, this is actually work with uh, Karl Royen, who was a master's student in Göttingen, uh, Schumann, who's a postdoc and Frank Pollmann, uh, who's at uh, TU, as uh, most of you know. Um, and uh, this particular model lives on a triangular ladder. Um, here, uh, so a zigzag ladder, these are particles. Uh, and the constraint is such that particles can only move in an empty site if there's a neighboring empty site in the vicinity. No? And then you see what happens if you 
uh, have a very dilute gas, uh, then these vacancies that can't, um, uh, typically can't move at all, um, they're very rare, yeah, but as I crank up density, I will move into a regime where uh, the, these vacancies can only move uh, via the, uh, these uh, dimers that through perturbative processes move and then uh, can, can uh, make these, that uh, can delocalize the vacancies. Yeah? So the system has an inherent tendency um, uh, to localize uh, vacancies at high density. Okay, so this is where it came from. Um, and we'll actually, for the rest of the talk, be uh, sitting at relatively high filling. This is the Hamiltonian, so it's basically hardcore bosons. A particular type of interaction, it's a particle hole interaction, and the constraint uh, that I described actually acts on the entire Hamiltonian, the kinetic part, and the interaction. Uh, so the blue lines show where the interactions sit and where particles can move. So the reason why this was cooked up this way is because they wanted to have a rock uh, point uh, to begin with, not important for our story. And we actually took this Hamiltonian from the Nottingham group that uh, studied this, uh, that introduced this first in the quantum regime. Sorry, the yes. Yeah, so the I and J is basically on every near, uh, nearest neighbor side. Yeah? So this is basically the, the constraint that checks whether there's empty part particles in the vicinity. Uh, yeah, and I messed up the notation here. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so the other motivation why we wanted to do that is because we want to explicitly be able to remove an anti constraint. Uh, so here's the <laughs> constraint. Um, and once we remove it, we still have a non trivial quantum many body Hamiltonian that also has transport. Yeah? Because many of the other kinetic constraints, model like PXP models, don't really move particles around. And this one allows us to add and remove the, um, Hamilton, uh, the, the constraint. Uh, and that will be the main uh, aspect in this talk to, to see what the effect of uh, uh, removing the constraint is here. Uh, so this is the, the other uh, motivation here. All right. So what um, the Nottingham group uh, showed is, um, was basically mostly uh, based on the analysis of density autocorrelation functions um, written down here, averaged yeah, over all sides, um, and then computed in all possible computational basis state sets. Yeah? Uh, the normalization is simply such that we always start out from one. So here we looked at, uh, reproduced essentially uh, results from the Nottingham paper, um, no disorder so far. And what we do is we crank up the interaction here that um, sits on all these near nearest neighbor bonds. And I explain the coloring later. And what you see is that there is a certain set of states that have no dynamics whatsoever. Yeah? So those are obviously the states that have only isolated particles, so only vacancies, they can't move at all. So in a sense, perfect quantum star state, uh, quantum star states. Um, and then there is a set of state that once the interaction becomes strong enough, and then the interactions and uh, constraint conspire that uh, build these beautiful metastable uh, plateaus that actually extend over many uh, uh, decades here. So this is a logarithmic scale actually. Uh, so this was the main point of the, uh, of the Nottingham paper uh, to show that this metastable dynamics typical for glassy physics uh, shows up here. All right. So now what happened, okay, yeah, actually, before we come to this order, let me explain this a little bit in, um, yeah, in a hand-waving argument. Um, so the, the data here is for um, 12 sites. Yeah? Uh, the story is similar for larger system sizes. Um, and, and now you can basically look at typical clusters. Uh, here are the ones uh, that have only vacancies. Um, they have uh, zero energy. Uh, then there are states that have uh, yeah, these, these uh, vertical dimers and vacancies. Uh, and the interesting ones that are the most important ones for the story are the ones that have uh, horizontal dimers uh, and uh, uh, vacancies. So why are these ones are the, the most important ones? Uh, basically, in uh, a simple perturbative uh, argument, um, I have to move this one around. Yeah? So I have to move this particle here, make this um, um, a um, vertical dimer that this one can move without any energy cost. It can absorb. Uh, the vacancy and then reabsorb it or re-emit it into some direction. Yeah? But here I have to pay energy. Yeah? So there is a penalty here. As so I go from this subspace into that subspace, uh, and these are precisely uh, the states that have these uh, these plateaus and they scale in the expected uh, way with the uh, interaction state. Okay, so that's the underlying um, physics of this constraint model. But from this argument, you already see what will happen once you kick in this order. So basically, I can view it differently. I can say, okay, uh, the, the vacancies can only propagate uh, via intermediate states uh, with these uh, dimers, uh, meaning they have a very narrow bandwidth. Yeah? So any amount of disorder will probably immediately localize them. So that's the essential, uh, uh, yeah, that's the simple, um, the simple argument why localization will be relatively efficient here. Okay, so now let's do that. Let's uh, look at the constraint model. 
um, and go from uh, no disorder to relatively strong disorder, so zero um, one in units of hopping and then uh, strong disorder. And this is plotted for all these different families of, um, of uh, initial states. So here's what we saw before, so metastable plateaus. But then even uh, already at relatively weak disorder, and we see that all the states uh, get pushed up, they become, uh, they acquire uh, non-zero long time values, which really means that there's non-ergodic dynamics here. Um, and it's the ones here that have the plateaus first that typically have the largest uh, long time values. Um, so already at W equal J, everything has uh, non-decaying uh, correlations for the uh, entire spectrum. Um, and uh, the crucial ones are, again, the ones with these uh, horizontal dimers that need to flip at these points. Okay, so now comes the point uh, that is the main yeah, quantitative uh, point of the story. So now we remove the constraint and do the whole calculation again. Um, and now you see, okay, in the absence of the constraint at zero disorder, it's all fast decaying uh, autocorrelations. Um, and we can actually easily uh, work out the, the relaxation times here. Um, then I kick in uh, this order, and then the states also acquire long time values, but they are much smaller. Um, and, um, and, and, and that already is, a, is a, the first key uh, indication that this system is less prone to localization. It has smaller long time values. Um, and as you will see in a second, it also kicks in uh, uh, much later. So now we want to do this systematically as a function of this order strength. Um, and the way um, that, we, yeah, that we decided to, to illustrate this is we look at the fraction of metastable initial states, so initial states that lead to metastable dynamics out of the whole uh, Hilbert space. And for the constraint model, so look at the scale again. Yeah? So this is logarithmic, uh, this sort of strength on a logarithmic scale. Uh, there's always some states that don't decay. Those are the ones with only vacancies. And then uh, 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 all the others kick in quickly. And already at this sort of strength between uh, just uh, one and 10, all of them are fully, um, uh, have, um, yeah, all of them are fully, uh, have uh, non-decaying long time, uh, time values. There's the unconstrained model does the same, but much later. And again, here's the important point, the difference between where this, uh, uh, these long time values all set in, uh, which I would call like uh, delta WC, is of the order of basically uh, uh, 10 in units of hopping. No? So there's an, a relatively uh, direct and easy mechanism to push the critical or like the, the crossover uh, disorder strength on final system sizes uh, back to much smaller scales by um, combining this with uh, kinetic constraints in this model. All right, so I guess I'm doing okay on time. Um, so then I want to use a, a couple of slides um, uh, to transition over from the um, time domain here. Uh, to the analysis of, of eigenstate properties. Um, and one quantity that um, uh, we, we yeah, in the past uh, started to uh, like quite a bit in the analysis of disorder systems is based on the analysis of the entire distribution of densities. So this is now for the situation done for the standard uh, model of spinless fermions plus nearest neighbor interactions and quench disorder. Here for very uh, weak disorder, so you see typically um, yeah, normal distributed uh, expectation values of local densities. As you make system size larger, it will become sharper and it will be centered around uh, average density. And in the uh, yeah, localized phase on finite systems, we have this typical bimodal distribution. Yeah, so we know that there's discussion about whether this survives um, uh, for large system sizes, but bear with me for a moment. It's just to illustrate the, uh, the quantity that we are using. Um, and it's called an occupation distance. This is work with the former postdoc Miroslav Hopjan, who's now in uh, Ljubljana and Juliano also from Paris. Um, and what we now do is, uh, for every one of these expectation values, we subtract the distance to the closest integer. Yeah? So if I'm in the localized regime, the distance is practically zero because most of the cases I hit zero or a small number of one. Yeah? So this number is essentially zero, uh, whereas in the delocalized phase, um, in the limit of large distance sizes, I basically approach uh, average filling. Yeah? So and, the reason why this is nice, because it captures um, at the same time real space localization, because this is essentially uh, yeah, in real space and Fox space localization, because this tells us that we have, uh, yeah, at least on finite systems, Fox space localization. So we can, can capture both of things at the same time. Um, and it's a fairly easy to calculate quantity numerically and potentially also in experiments. So that's why we um, started to, to use this a lot in the analysis. 
and I'll show you as an illustration that this actually works uh, in known cases. We'll, uh, in the next figures, do it differently. I will look at um, average density minus this occupation distance here. Okay, so here's an example where we calculated this for um, a non-attracting model that has a known transition uh, as a function of disorder strengths, actually with quasi periodic disorder here, the uh, 1D opion dre model. Um, that has a delocalized phase here up to a two and then uh, localizes. Uh, and you see the nice thing is um, these curves as a function of system size very quickly approach this limit. So there's usually very small finite size effects, very different from any other um, uh, measures. Uh, and we reproduce the known uh, value quite neatly doing the correct scaling collapse according to the no, uh, known uh, scaling theories here. So then you can also apply this to the model of disordered interacting fermions in 1D. Um, again, this occupation distance, if I um, plot it as n minus this occupation distance, this order average goes to zero in the ergodic phase, and then it does so very quickly. And it's again nice because we approach the transition from the ergodic side. So this is the regime where we are sure that it's actually uh, ETH, meaning that, we, that we, on every system size we get a lower bound to what the actual uh, transition uh, uh, critical uh, disorder strength will be. And then in the MDL phase, it becomes essentially system size independent, but we know, okay, we have to do, we don't have a real scaling theory here. Um, in this case, it's still open, but at least it illustrates that we relatively quickly uh, approach the expected value on the ergodic side. Okay, so that's one of the two quantities that we're using um, uh, to, to close up the story here. Uh, so now we go back to this kinetically constrained models with disorder, and we calculated this occupation distance Here's a function of uh, interaction strength and uh, logarithmic uh, disorder again. This is risk constraint, this is unconstrained, this is essentially sampling over eigenstates uh, from the center of the spectrum. Um, and then you can see if you follow the green line between constrained and unconstrained model that there's the same order of uh, uh, 10 difference in the crossover scale going from delocalization to localization. So clearly the constrained model in this case uh, favors localization. So the same is essentially seen in the half-chain entanglement entropy, constrained model here, unconstrained model on the other side. Um, then, uh, yeah, so these are typical distributions as you would expect it uh, deep in a localized phase. Uh, and again, the unconstrained model transitions over to the shape much later than the uh, constrained model. Okay, so basically that's the key summary. Yeah? So we see that in our case, kinetic constraints, uh, yeah, lead to these, um, uh, the, to, to the motion of um, vacancies in this model that have a, a very small um, essential effective hopping matrix sediment, making them very susceptible to, to thawing and disorder. It's an easy way to basically uh, scale down disorder, critical disorder strengths into the regime of um, uh, values that are order of the bare hopping element uh, again here, yeah? compared to standard MBL models where they are now believed to be much larger or divergent at all. Okay, so in this story, we did not try yet to extrapolate to the infinite system size limit. It's all based on finite size numerics that suffers from the all known problems. So that's one of the open problems, of course, uh, going to larger L and then go from crossover um, values here to, uh, to, to see how it uh, scales up. Right now, we don't have any good idea of how to do it better than what we already did. Yeah, we could potentially not, uh, still do uh, DMRG calculations, but that is usually limited um, once we hit the ergodic regime, we will be usually facing entanglement. Um, there's also other kinetically constrained models that uh, one can think about. The question is, is there ultimately a systematics to frame all of these models under some, uh, some umbrella that, that we have no idea about yet or no clear path about yet? Uh, there's clearly other models where the same game applies. If you think about, for instance, polarons in the solid state context, electrons, that are addressed by uh, phonons, then they are also typically much heavier, uh, and they uh, will also be susceptible to disorder and uh, um, uh, localize more quickly, and potentially also, of course, in frustrated systems uh, where you can have flat bands uh, and uh, already have an inherent tendency to localize particles. Okay, so then to summarize here in this example, um, we, have, uh, we clearly see that kinetic constraints favor localization. Um, the key point is the comparison to the unconstrained model, uh, where the crossover to localization happens an order of magnitude um, later than in the model with constraints. And the perspective on MBL is that here uh, in these systems, on the accessible system sizes and hence also on possibly mesoscopic systems, uh, the crossover scales can be of the order of J, very different from what's now being discussed for 
uh, yeah, the standard models for MBA. Okay, so with that, I will use the last two moments to advertise an upcoming PhD school uh, and that will happen in Göttingen here uh, on non-ergodic quantum dynamics next year in September. Um, we'll probably send out advertisements uh, sometime early next year. That's our beautiful campus, yeah, uh, great for experiments, but there's also beautiful architecture and stuff in town uh, besides the history of the city. Uh, and perhaps uh, some of the people that are watching uh, uh, might uh, find this interesting. So with that, thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, plenty of time for questions. Thanks for the excellent talk. Any questions? Maybe I can ask one. So can you uh, comment uh, uh, a little bit more on the uh, sort of experimental implementation of this? You kind of mentioned things you were motivated by, but I didn't, re I wasn't sure I caught whether like the specific Hamiltonian you were studying with and without constraints, whether this can be implemented anywhere? No, that's a good question. Uh, so at this point there is no, there was no idea of looking at, of, of thinking about how we can implement this particular model. Yeah, but uh, there are cert certainly other families of models that are easier to Im implement. Um, the, the PXP model has, of course, been studied already with this order. Um, yeah, but the, easy, the, the simple answer is, in this case, there's no direct path yet that we have figured out how to implement that. Uh, thank you for the talk. I didn't understand how, how generic is this 10J reduction. Uh, so is it for your model or do you expect it to? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, here the, the basic physics here is simple. Yeah? So you have a mechanism that makes the, the bandwidths of uh, particles very narrow. Yeah? So, so you would naively expect that this should also work in, in all other systems that do that. Yeah? So polarons is an example. Um, and uh, the, the, Again, in the polonic system where you couple to phonons, ultimately there's an environment, but on intermediate times, um, probably, uh, and the data that we have that we've been published also shows that you will have similar physics. Yeah, yeah just a quick question. I think when you were introducing the, the hardcore boson model on triangular yeah. lattice, you said that uh, these kind of act autocorrelation functions which persist long times are very reminiscent of glassy dynamics, but yeah. now you also have this localization physics which has been kind yeah. of uh, mixed with mixed in with that. So do, uh, what, have you looked at the wave functions that instead of exponentials, are they showing stretched exponentials like it's kind of uh, reminiscent ah, okay. of... Um, yeah, so you mean uh, uh, stretch exponentials in the, in the autocorrelation functions? Yeah, yeah. yeah so we, we looked at that, we don't see that. Yeah, so that uh, is not in the data here yet. Yeah. Do you uh, have an but, intuition why that's not appearing even though do you... Well, as far as I know, the stretch exponentials are more suggested for the pre-thermal MBL regime. Yeah. In glass physics, um, so, and here I'm not sure if the glass physics still survives to the, uh, to the regime that we are looking at. Yeah. So this is probably more dominated by, uh, by, by the um, disorder physics here at the, um, at the system sizes and scales that we're looking at. So in that sense, the connection to actual glass physics is still also still a bit open. Yeah. So I wouldn't claim that, uh, that I see glass physics here once I get a foreign disorder. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, in the PHP case, I think there were other studies that looked at you can have MBL if you have a different type yeah. of, um, of disorder yeah. so that the terms still commute. Have you tried different disorder in your case and do you see different? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so, so I think that's, uh, that, that's correct and the PXP case, it depends on the details of how you implement disorder. So here, a natural next question is to look at bond disorder, which we haven't done yet, it's on the list. Yeah. Uh, so I agree it's a good question, but we ha don't have any data yet to, uh, to address that. And another question, uh, as you mentioned, like in the PHP case, you have Hilbert space that fragments, and here, as I understand, you don't. Do you think that plays a role in the emergence of MBL? So the question is uh, fragmentation, or? So in PHP, everything was done in the largest connected sector, right, with no yeah. neighboring excitation? Yeah. But in your case, you don't have any fragmentation. You just have yeah. a few scars. Yeah, so thanks. So that, that's actually correct. So in our case, it's basically standard symmetries and then a tail of just one dimensional subspaces and no, no, uh, no fragmentation. Um, so fragmentation in itself can also lead to a strong ergodicity breaking. So it's not necessarily uh, competing with, with what I'm saying here. 
It's just saying that the mechanism here is, is, is not the same as you would have in, in strongly fragmented models. Thank you. Uh, hi. So when you're looking at these autocorrelation functions, so ah, okay. uh, are you looking at the scaling of the asymptotic value as well? Like uh, are they scaling as inverse of the Hilbert space dimension in the ergodic regime? Or in the localized regime, they are uh, almost constant, like the exponents? Um, yeah. Also a good question. The scaling, they have not fully addressed it. Yeah? So you mean the long time value or? Yeah. 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 So when they are equilibrated. Um, yeah. I think I have a slide here. Yeah, we didn't look at, specifically at the scaling yet. That's essentially the diagonal ensemble, so the, the, the long time average of, uh, of all these autocorrelation functions, now taking the infinite time average. And you see clearly, of course, that for the constraint model, small system sizes all have, uh, um, yeah, see those states that uh, yeah, have no um, dynamics at all. Um, system size suppresses this a little bit, obviously. Yeah, but there's still uh, this, this difference here in this, where the full, uh, increase sets between the constrained and unconstrained model. And the unconstrained model on finite systems is nothing down here. Yeah, but we have not looked at any serious uh, uh, scaling analysis yet. And on parallel, are you looking at the correlation between the energy levels because they can be uh, yeah. indicative of the same wavelength? Yeah, exactly. That's another good question. So, so we, of course, tried gap ratio as the first thing. It turns out that in this model that the density of states is typically not very continuous yet in the regime that is interesting. Uh, so that makes the analysis of gap ratios much more difficult, uh, but looking at uh, spectral form factors in these systems is another, another direction. Yeah? So essentially, one of the next projects here is to look at off-diagonal ETH, if you wish, matrix uh, off-diagonal matrix sediments to see if we can uh, connect uh, wait a minute, the metastable dynamics to the distribution of off-diagonal matrix sediments, um, and then long-range correlations in the spectrum. It's on the list, but we haven't done it yet. Thank you. More questions? We have still have time. Uh, do these systems you've studied have classical analogs so that you can compare uh, spectral measures of chaos with uh, classical ones? Yeah, in principle, they come from classical systems. That's correct. Um, it's, a, it's a great idea, yeah. um, but we have not pursued that yet. Yeah. More questions? Okay, well, if not, let's uh, thank Fabian again, and we're, um, so we're back here at four for a panel discussion with some of the, uh, yeah, some of the invited people, so.